I now like, would like to welcome up our second panel of the day, focusing on emerging innovation, and I'd welcome uh, Michael Denham, the President and CEO of BDC, to offer some opening remarks. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, C'est vraiment un plaisir pour moi d'être ici avec vous et surtout d'être devant un groupe de Canadiens si accompli et uh, impressionné que vous autres. Um, we have an excellent, uh, timely panel discussion that lies ahead. We have some great panelists and I think you really enjoy their perspective on innovation. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have a great conversation today. So my purpose really is just to introduce it. But before I do, um, I want to give you a bit of a word from the field. So BDC, uh, we have, um, we're the only financial institution focused uh, on entrepreneurs. We've got 2,100 employees across the country, uh, 110 business centers. And in that context, I want to acknowledge uh, the work that both Minister Baines and His Excellency the Governor General have done across many different fronts, but most importantly, in terms of setting the tone for innovation in this country. It's just remarkable as I travel the country and as our folks work with entrepreneurs, we've got over 100,000 interactions per year with our clients. It's amazing the tone that's taken root about innovation, about innovation, uh, about success, about growth, I and mean, a lot of that comes from the tone being set by the Governor General and by the Minister. I also want to take this opportunity to, want to uh, acknowledge um, uh, the work of um, then Minister John Manley, who 20-ish years ago um, pushed through the formation of the BDC and passed the BDC Act back in 1995, which changed uh, the FBDB into BDC and uh, moved us from a lender of rest last resort to a complementary financial institution focused singularly on helping entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship in Canada. Uh, I don't think the BDC has ever had as much impact as we're having today. And amongst the many things you've accomplished, uh, John, this thing is a very, very important part of your legacy. So on behalf of our 42,000 clients, I just want to thank you for that active leadership 20 years ago. Now to the topic we face. Uh, we face multiple challenges in lifting Canada's economic growth prospects. And I'd like to focus on one of them the challenge with which many folks in this room are familiar. As Minister Baines mentioned, we're getting a lot better at establishing innovative startup firms, but we struggle in turning these firms into companies that have the size and skill to compete globally. We struggle, to use the Minister's term, at scaling up. Now, the Government of Canada has acknowledged this challenge and has made this one of its priorities, as we just heard. Indeed, Minister Baines has established this as an important piece a critical piece in the national innovation puzzle. And we look forward to our panelists' view on this topic. So at BDC, we deal with 42,000 businesses across Canada. So we see an enormous amount of really exciting, really interesting, really successful businesses, business leaders, and ideas. We lend to, we invest in, and we advise these companies. These are the companies that have the potential, in some cases, to change the world. Let me give you a couple of examples. One is a company called General Fusion. It's a company that is working on commercializing, uh, developing commercial scale fusion power, a process that really mimics the process of the sun, but done on a commercial scale to lead to, to abundant, clean, and cheap energy. Or a company called Turnstone. It's a biotech firm. Uh, it's developing a cancer vaccine that harnesses the patient's own immunity system to attack the cancer itself. So these are exceptional Canadian businesses these are growing Canadian businesses led by extraordinary entrepreneurs who really have set their sights on changing the world. And we're proud of BBC, BDC to be a capital provider and a contributor to the success of these companies. Now, there are hundreds and probably thousands of examples just like this. However, in a more macro light, we see too many examples of entrepreneurs of great companies who don't achieve the scale they should. We've carried out extensive research and extensive consultations on the issues of innovation and on scalability to find out why. So here's what we found. We drew a detailed picture of small and medium-sized firms in Canada over a 12-year period from 2001 to 2013. And we looked at how these companies are performing in terms of scale. We just updated this research and released the update literally a couple of weeks ago. So specifically, we looked at the challenge of growing small businesses into medium-sized businesses, those companies that have at least 100 employees. 
So why this focus? Well, from our research, companies with more than 100 employees really punch above their weight in terms of economic impact. This was part of the research. And to give you just an example, these mid-sized companies, companies with between 100 and 500 employees, represent less than 1% of businesses in Canada. However, they generate 12% of our country's GDP. They generate 12% of our exports value. Uh, they account for 17% of private sector investment in R&D. And this same 1% of companies are also creating 16% of jobs and are taking steps to revolutionize and disrupt their industries. These firms are also at the core of Canada's international success. However, and this is the big challenge, we just don't have enough of them. In 2013, we benchmarked on an economy-adjusted basis versus the U.S. and found that Canada is at two-thirds the level of the U.S. in terms of the number of medium-sized companies. So we looked to update this, and what did we find? Well, the gap is actually widening. We're heading, we're heading in the wrong direction. So this is the challenge. We need to find a way to change that trajectory, change that trajectory and create more Canadian mid-sized firms. Now, the situation is complex, there's no doubt. We need multiple responses from the government, from the private sector, from investors, from universities, and from other parties. And as a development bank, BDC's focus is set on business solutions that complement those offered by private sector financial service providers. We're focused on filling market gaps and offer to entrepreneurs uninterrupted access to capital at all stages of growth, early stage, growth, maturity, and beyond. So we provide term loans, subordinated debt, growth equity, and venture capital. And we're proud to be delivering the Venture Capital Action Plan on behalf of the Government of Canada that has raised $1.3 billion in venture capital with over $900 million coming from the private sector. In addition to all this, we have a comprehensive suite of advisory services and advisory solutions that are geared to help businesses scale up to compete in international markets. We have a program we just started that is designed with a single purpose to accelerate the growth of ambitious, high-growth firms. We can give them access to a Canada-wide Canada network of advisors, executives, all of whom have a solid track record of business leadership in sectors from oil and gas to technology to retail to manufacturing. So the good news is we have great brains and great research in Canada. Companies like Orpix, which we'll hear about in a moment, led by Brianne, will, she'll have very interesting perspectives on the topic of innovation and scaling up. I think we also need to do a better job at talking up our success so that more companies learn about these examples and aspire to become just like them. So now is a great opportunity to share and find ways to do more collectively, to develop a culture of innovation and growth in Canada. But most importantly, I think this discussion will help us drill down more deeply into how we can work together to better support Canadian innovation and the Canadian innovation landscape. Thank you very much, and Janet, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Michael, for the, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I am joined today by four outstanding panelists from Toronto, Waterloo, Calgary, and Vancouver, who each bring a unique perspective on growing new businesses in Canada. Um, to my right uh, is Marty Reed. Marty is the president and C CEO of Evoke In Innovations. Evoke Innovations is a $100 million clean tech fund. He is also on the board of Dark Vision Technologies, which uses new imaging technology to see the inner workings of oil and gas wells. Uh, Brianne Everett is co-founder and CEO of OFIX. OFIX has created a wearable sensor platform to help identify and prevent complications from diseases such as diabetes. She is also a medical doctor and recipient of the Governor General's Innovation Award. Uh, next on the panel is Ilsa Tr Trunick. Um, Ilsa is the CEO of Mars Discovery District in Toronto, a leading innovation hub in, in Toronto. Mars supports entrepreneurs building high growth firms in health, clean tech, work and learning, finance and commerce sec sectors. And finally, but certainly not least, uh, Raymond Laflamme is Executive Director for the Institute of Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. He is also Program Director at the Canadian Institution, Institute for Advanced Research and Associate Professor at the Perimeter Institute. So we are looking forward to the next hour or so of talking about how growing new businesses in Canada can help to propel our growth. 
We've heard a lot this morning about how we, can, how we need to boost Canada's growth rate. How can, or sorry, can, can Canadian early stage or high growth tech companies help to address this? The answer is yes. According to a recent report, the Toronto Waterloo Corridor alone could create 175,000 high quality jobs from young tech companies over the next 10 years. Young tech companies drive significant value to the economy. In Silicon Valley, for example, em employees contribute 30% more economic value than the average American employee driven by their young tech company on e ecosystem. So to kick off this panel, we will first start to talk about what are the challenges that are facing Canada's innovation landscape, particularly for small, medium businesses. And Brianne, I'll turn it over to you first and would love to hear a little bit about what your company does and some of the challenges you have had al along your entrepreneurial journey. Um, I apologize for my voice today, I've got some laryngitis, so. Um, I, I guess I'll rewind the story to why I founded this company and the problem that we're really trying to address. Um, so as Janet said, my background is in medicine. Um, I had been training in Calgary, had completed my MD, and I was uh, continuing on to pursue uh, a residency training in plastic and reconstructive surgery. And in the process of doing that, I, we, we, I, one of the, the types of patients we tend to see are people who have diabetes and diabetic foot disease, so ulcers um, that have arisen because of the diabetes. Um, the, the problem there is that about two-thirds of people with diabetes lose sensation in their feet, and so they, they lose the ability to perceive the feeling of the ground beneath their feet, and they can essentially wear holes in their feet. So very similar to how you might chew a hole in your tongue or cheek if you have dental freezing in, the same thing happens on an ongoing basis with these patients. So what, what would happen is that we'd see somebody, they'd, they'd be hospitalized for care of a foot ulcer, we'd provide either wound care advice or in some instances reconstructive surgery, and then inevitably, it doesn't matter how hard that patient was trying to actually heal that wound, they seem to always break down again. And the problem was because they couldn't feel their feet. So the idea that underpinned Orpix was, what if we could create technologies that would reestablish that sensory loop for that, the, that individual? What if we could create a technology that replaced pain that no longer existed in these patients and therefore either prevent these wounds, mitigate these wounds, or, or treat them in, in the context of an active wound? So uh, I, I grouped together with a number of, of physicians, surgeons, entrepreneurs, engineers. We co-founded this company in 2010. Um, I realized that I couldn't run a startup company while completing your residency and doing 100 hours a week in the hospital. So um, after a year of trying to balance the two, uh, I took an educational leave, completed an MBA, and started with the company full time. Uh, so where we are at today is we've created a commercial product called the Surosense RX device, which is a pressure-sensitive insert that goes in the shoe, takes information from the bottom of the foot over time, provides feedback to a peripheral device, so it could be either a smartwatch or a mobile device, to allow the patient to know when they need to offload their feet. And they essentially respond to that advice and go on with their day-to-day their -day business. Um, what we've seen in our clinical studies is that the device is able to reduce the risk of reulceration in these high-risk patients by about 83%. So even as a very small company, um, we've literally already been able to save feet and save lives. So it's um, really exciting to be a part of. Um, we're moving now into more advanced wound care, so applications of the same technology in, in for example, bed sore prevention. Um, so that's, that's where we're at as a company. Um, it sounds easy when you kind of just talk about it in a one minute snapshot, but there are certainly challenges that exist in, in the, the startup community uh, and ecosystem in, in Canada. And um, I, I, I think that we'll, we'll get a little bit more into some of the, the major problems that, that we've faced and, 
and the things that we've really had to fight through over the last five to six years. Um, but I would say that at the top of the list has certainly been the financing environment in, in Canada. Um, we've, rece we've received a tremendous support in terms of grants, awards, recognition. Obviously, the Governor General's Innovation Award was a tremendous accolade that we were, we were so um, honored to receive. And I think that the, that idea of a culture of innovation certainly exists. I think that the idea that Canadians are innovative certainly exists. But I think that the, the deficiency in, and what I've really faced is that there is a huge gap in med tech financing, particularly in this country. And um, I would say that I'm a fighter. Like, I'll just keep fighting. I'll just, I'll bang my head against the wall and people will say, banging your head against the wall isn't good for your head or the wall, but I'll just keep banging. Um, but at, at the end of the day, there's, there are certain obstacles that you just seem to not be able to overcome and you've got to weave around them. And so one of the challenges we've, we've faced is, is trying to find, fill that financing gap. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. And what are the other options if you can't actually finance a company? So um, that, I think those are the, the initial comments that I want to make and then um, we'll get into it a little bit later. Okay, great, thank you very much. Osa. Can you talk a little bit, based on your experience at, at Mars, but what have you seen as some of the key challenges facing young companies? Um, well, we've heard a fair bit about them already um, this morning. I think the first, um, the first thing, I, two things I would say is the really exciting opportunity for us right now, if you think back even 10 years ago when, when Mars first opened its doors, is uh, we, have, uh, we have seen a huge maturing of, um, of the pipeline of companies. So stronger companies get started um, and, um, and you know, we have more shots on goal. So we're working with a stronger population with, with more uh, players that have the potential to scale. At the same time, we, we have to be very intentional about uh, treating that small subset of companies anywhere between 4 to 10 percent of young companies have you know, what it takes to become uh, high growth firms and treat them differently from traditional small businesses. I often hear this sort of generic term of many businesses in Canada are small. And then within that, there are sector differences. So the financing gap in healthcare companies or in clean tech companies, even at the earliest stages, are, are quite significantly bigger than they would be in, in traditional tech, tech type companies. So tailoring for the unique needs of scaling companies and the unique needs within the sectors, I think is a really key piece if we're going to be successful. Um, and following that then, you run into some of the barriers you heard Tom talk about and Michael. Um, capital, you know, at the different stages of acceleration and, and uh, ultimately to really achieve growth. Um, getting the talent that, that have the global perspective, because one of the realities for those scaling firms is we have a small local market. And for most of them, their first customer won't be here, their market making customer won't be here, they will have 30 to 40 percent of the venture capital their competitors south of the border have, uh, and they typically work with less, um, um, less experienced teams. And so the, the challenge to get into those global markets as efficiently as possible is, is really critical and needing to, the opportunity to think creatively about how we pair them with some of our more established firms that are already doing business in those markets is a really key piece. Um, the other missed opportunity, and Tom spoke about this eloquently this morning, is when you look at our regulated sectors, which is perhaps, if you think at the feeder system coming out, out of our universities and the extraordinary talent just in, in life sciences and healthcare, for example, we really need to be absolutely um, determined to turn our own systems into better receptors for those technologies. And this is particularly true um, in areas like healthcare or energy. Um, and make sure that those systems can um, become a test bed, not because they're a final market destination, uh, but because that gives the validation for those companies to uh, when they show up in global markets, have a reference customer at home. Of course, we want to also get our own innovations to Canadians um, and make our own systems more productive by becoming better adopters of those innovations. So thinking about that whole continuum, not just boosting supply 
and making sure the supply side has the talent and the capital to grow, but also boosting the receptor side, um, sometimes called procurement, but there's lots of other ways in which uh, that validation can happen um, as a springboard for global markets are, are, are essential. And I would say in the regulated industries in particular, uh, we have not yet cracked that, that nut of thinking of those systems as economic development tools, not just as systems that provide healthcare to Canadians or energy supply to Canadians. Right. Okay, great. Now, Marty, uh, Elsa mentioned about the clean tech sector and some of the specific challenges there. I'd be interested in your perspective as the CEO of a clean tech fund, uh, what you've seen as some of the challenges. Well, I'll uh, wait for the microphone to come on. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll mention three areas that, uh, that I've seen, and I might also add, I, I bring a unique perspective, uh, I think, to this, as I'm, I am American, spent the last 20 years in Silicon Valley uh, as an entrepreneur and an investor in, in, in launched Evoke in Vancouver uh, just over a year ago, but have been investing in Canada for, uh, for close to a decade now. Um, the first, and it's been talked about a lot today, is talent, uh, but I want to be very specific. Uh, there's been a, a fair bit of generalities, so I'll, I'll in my comments, get, get a bit more uh, focused. Uh, I think there is uh, a great wealth of talent in this country on the uh, sciences, engineering in particular, uh, but a, a shortage uh, in two areas, finance, uh, sales marketing, and biz dev. Uh, part of that is structural, um, meaning you start with great universities, great education system producing STEM students, uh, and then NAFTA also allows for a much freer flow of immigration of uh, tech uh, talent. When it comes to sales, marketing, and finance, that does not exist. Um, and then what, what is it within the system that, that, uh, that sort of causes that to self-fulfill and exacerbate itself? Your top talent in finance in this country generally focuses on what is referred to as stacking, which I had never heard of uh, until I moved to this country. Stacking is maximizing government funding. Um, in the US, uh, generally your finance talent is focused on you know, raising money from, from private investors, uh, building out growth models, supporting the growth of the company. Uh, similarly, on sales, marketing, and biz dev, your top business development person in this country, again, I'm speaking to early stage also, to be fair, uh, your top biz dev person is an expert at raising money from the government um, as opposed to from customers. Uh, and that leads me to my second issue, which is uh, customer focus. Uh, part of it is this dependency on government. The other part of it is, uh, again, self-fulfilling. I've looked at almost every government funding program in this country, and they all are focused on technology readiness levels, or basically developing a widget. And you cannot take any of those dollars and focus on actually trying to address a customer problem, uh, what we would call the customer discovery process. Um, and that needs to start from the very foundation formation of the company. Uh, you need to be interacting with customers. Uh, Tom talked about it in his opening remarks today. Uh, you've got to be solving problems and, and iterating quickly, uh, and that's, that's, that's fundamental. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll mention uh, specific to the funding gap. Similarly, all of the funding programs we have in this country uh, are basically designed to, to get a company right to about to this point where it's ready to take off, and then they just they shut. Uh, and we won't support companies into that early commercialization and then into full commercialization phase. And, and that's an enormous gap. We, we need to solve that challenge uh, so that we can, again, provide a continuum so that then companies get to the point where they're uh, profitable uh, and able to then uh, self-sustain. So uh, let me mention one other uh, as it relates to talent because it, it just keeps popping into my brain. Uh, we talk a lot about the quality of education and uh, uh, global rankings of universities. Global rankings of universities is, is again, sort of generic, and, and, and I want to be more specific. If you look at the two biggest epicenters of innovation in the US, it's uh, Silicon Valley and Boston. Both of those areas, by the way, have two top 20 MBA programs in the world. In the case of uh, San Francisco, it's Stanford and UC Berkeley. In the case of Boston, it's MIT and Harvard. And I think there's 
there's, uh, there's a direct correlation between the quality of your MBA programs and the amount of innovation coming out. So we can't just focus on STEM and engineering. We have to provide all the tools and resources necessary for a company, and a lot of that will come out of your MBA programs. Thanks, Marty. I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. Uh, Ray, turning it over to you, uh, you spent 10 years in the U.S. Uh, building on Marty's comments about the U.S., I'd be interested in your perspective on this issue, and I know you also have some very um, relevant thoughts around ecosystems and sort of how, what is an ecosystem and how we need to build the Canadian ecosystem. So, okay. <clears throat> I'll get to ecosystem in a second, but okay. come back with a few historical remarks. In fact, following up some of the comments that uh, the Governor General mentioned, the importance of going abroad. I was incredibly lucky at the age of 23. I got a fellowship from NSERC to go to Cambridge University. I applied to many places, did not succeed everywhere, which taught me about failure is not the end of the world, but got accepted to go to Cambridge, ended up going there, then followed up to go to Vancouver, back to Cambridge, and then the US for 10 years. And I've learned lots of different things. And sometimes I think the rest of the world is the same, that my colleagues in Canada or my friends and all this have this international perspective or not. And from time to time I hear, oh no, it is very different. So learning about this has been critical. So let's go to ecosystem. We've heard from Tom Jenkins this morning about this idea of this conveyor belt. And I liked it and heard exactly this way before. I like it for a couple of reasons. One of them is if you have a conveyor belt, then you have a vision at the end of where you want to go. A conveyor belt goes somewhere. So social impact or a partner device or something like this that you want to put. Then it has many parts, a conveyor belt. One breaks, then the whole thing stops. And that's an important piece. And then you can start with where it comes from and where does the conveyor belt start from. And then we've heard it before, talent. And I don't think we can emphasize this again and again and again. When I came back to Canada, in fact, recruited by two inspiring people, the Governor General in his previous position at the University of Waterloo and Mike Lazaridis, I remember telling them, tell, them telling to me, the most important things you will do to set up the institute is to hire people. And I never did this. And I, look back, and indeed, this is the most important thing. But you need other piece in the conveyor belt. You need to have a strong research and development base. You need to, if you want to do innovation, you need to have an entrepreneurial spirit. You need to have competition. In the day-to-day, -day, competition is not the most fun things, because you see other people kind of beating you at different things. But the long term, this is what raised the bar. And you need to do it, and you need to do it more and more on a global scale. And once you have all this, and me as a scientist, we did a PhD on the beginning of the universe. I thought that only on my own and with equation, I could solve all these problems. I quickly realized, being the director of the institute, I had only 24 hours a day, because we kind of, Brianne understand this too. And you need people to help you to do the different parts. So you have to network for the parts where you don't have that partner strengths, and you look around. And that's how the ecosystem is working. I look at, I'm incredibly lucky to be in Waterloo where there is these elements who are there. And it's an ecosystem which is emerging. So it was not there, at least the one on quantum 10, 15 years ago. And I see the different parts of it. And if anybody has advice about what are the parts that are missing there, please come and help us. Because I believe it will have a fundamental impact on society in the future. So networking, we need venture capital, and we need to have a receptive community. Um, Michael mentioned, Martin mentioned, the role of government, all of this. And I think we'll get back to that in future conversation. Great. OK, thanks very much. So we just uh, building on your thought, on your notion in terms of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And I mean, to what extent does the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Waterloo, you know, how developed is that? And what more can we do in that to develop other ecosystems that are really strong that can foster these high growth companies? So when I moved to the US, to Canada, I always thought of the US as the country of the free market. And I came to Canada, and the great surprise that I had was how hands-off 
the government was in many areas for innovation that agencies like DARPA don't exist. I stumble in the area of science, quantum science, where suddenly there was an impact on the long term, 20 years, 25 years on national security. And suddenly the government would come very mission driven because they wanted to know where was that technology going. They would come, they would fund the research, but every three months they would come back and say, what is the progress that you have done? The program manager knew not only the science I had done, but they had asked colleagues about what the value of what I had done, so they would come and challenge. This is something I, had not see, I haven't seen in Canada, that kind of very strong direction where government plays a role. Okay. And this is something where I believe we have to do something. The second part, which again, we've heard a little bit about this procurement. It is puzzling to me that all this resources and this wealth that we use in procurement is not targeted towards creating innovation. We seem to think that value is related to get the cheapest thing possible, which might be okay on the short term, but on the long term, we're really missing these parts. So suddenly I see these pieces which are missing in the ecosystem, which we will need to grow if we want to go around. And we have to do it in such a way that we have a Canadian solution to this. We cannot imitate Israel. We cannot imitate the US. We cannot Im imitate Sweden or Finland. We have to think about a place where what is important for us and how do we do it with the talent and the people that we have and force thing, things so that it does resonate with Canadian. I see in the US a lot of innovation relates to the defensive agencies. They have used this incredibly well and they make the trickle down economics so that people, that what they create goes and has a broad impact. There's this beautiful book by Mariana Mazzucano, The Entrepreneurial State, where they talk about many of the piece of the iPhone. Where did it come from? And for somebody who comes from Waterloo, it hurts reading that book. Because you say, why didn't we do this? Yes. But we have to learn how to do this and do this the right way. We've heard this morning, maybe climate change is a place where we can push. Maybe health is the other places where we can do this. Yeah, okay. Great, thank you very much, that, that's uh, very insightful. Now, building on sort of this theme about, hey, what can we learn from other countries? Marty, I know you've spent the majority of your life outside Canada. What do you see um, that's being done well either in the US or other countries that Canada can learn from to address our innovation challenges? I can pause for the microphone to come on. Um, and I'm gonna throw a bit of a wet blanket on the party just because. Um, you know, this morning Tom put up a chart that showed productivity uh, of Canada versus the US. Um, and then a couple slides later showed a, a cartoon and one of the comments on there was uh, someone saying our entrepreneurs aren't uh, sufficiently motivated or some such. Uh, and I think that actually is spot on. Uh, I think there is a lack of intensity within the uh, ecosystem here uh, as compared to Silicon Valley and certainly as compared to say innovation hubs in China. Uh, when I look at, uh, again, just, just the flat out intensity of how hard teams are working, how much they're scrapping, there's, a, there's a, just a fundamental gap that to me accounts for an enormous difference in productivity. And, and I'll give a really <laughs> real life example, which is anytime a venture fund in Silicon Valley is asking themselves, should they invest in Canada? One of the first questions they're asking themselves is will this management team work as hard as a team in the Valley. Every time. And, and with some occasion that answer is yes, but more times than not, the answer is no. Um, what do I think we can do about it? Uh, this will go back then to uh, a couple of these programs that I mentioned, or I talked about on the funding side. Uh, th there's a, a fundamental lack of competition uh, with a lot of these programs. So most early stage companies, we start with uh, SHRED, and then we go to IRAP, and then maybe we go to SDTC and throw in a bunch of four letters, and you could probably get funding from the government for it. But most of that funding is just sort of a show up, uh, you know, I call it sort of the attendance award. Um, 
whereas in, in the Valley, competition is just greater, period. We mentioned SBIR uh, earlier. That was been talked about as a model. SBIR, I agree, is a, is a great program. Uh, but the way that program works is you get your first tranche of funding, which is pretty modest. And then to get your second tranche, you got to be hitting it out of the park. And the failure rate between the first and the second, i.e. the number of companies that got that first tranche and then the second, it's pretty small. And it creates this culture where you've just got to work and grind and push and, and, and go a lot harder, a lot faster. Uh, and, and I don't think that same uh, emphasis uh, is here. So what is my recommendation? Don't necessarily change the, the amount of funding available. Just allocate it to the winners. Uh, not up front. I, I think, again, at the very early stage, we still want to be um, very much supporting a, a full diversity of, of opportunities. But then as companies uh, demonstrate that they are solving a customer problem, now let's give them a bigger piece of that pie and shift that away from some of the other programs that perhaps should have been uh, killed. Uh, I actually have a, a euphemism for it, forgive me. Um, but I see, you know, and I've, I've looked at hundreds of companies in Canada, and we have a whole category in our database that we just refer to now as shred walking dead. Companies that only exist because they get their shred refund. That, that shouldn't happen. That's a misallocation of, of resources. Yeah. So. Okay, Marty, thank you very much. I mean, just building on that from my own personal experience. So I'm a partner with uh, Wheel Ventures, which is the largest, most active early stage venture capital firm in Canada. And um, yeah, to be maybe just in blunt or maybe not, uh, uh, or, um, you know, not worrying about, but just trying to, to say it is that I meet with too many uh, entrepreneurs who I look at and I think, I just can't see this ever being a sustainable business. And then I say to them, well, how have you been funded to date? And they say, well, this government program and this government program and this government program and this government program. And as a taxpayer, it hurts me. And it's like, okay, I think the government can definitely play a role, but I'm not sure that it's the government who should be making the decisions in terms of which companies. Or as you say, there should be a bar and it should not be a lifeline that keeps them going. Um, but, you know, as I said, just sort of building on there, uh, on that sort of funding issue, one of the most common complaints from Canadian entrepreneurs is a lack of investment capital. Um, and just to, to put it in context in terms of some stats, in Canada, VC investments as a percentage of, his, of our GDP has historically been about half that in the U.S. Most recently, it's a third that of the U.S. And the CVCA, or the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, has recently come out with two major recommendations for the government, one of which is to uh, do more, do another VCAP 2.0 or another fund of funds um, to, give, uh, to give more funding to investments where um, you have people who are on the street who are, motor who are incented to make the right investment decisions. Um, but Brian, I would like to sort of turn it over to you and have you talked to the group in terms of what has been your experience firsthand in raising capital in Canada? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, my, my experience is obviously very uh, biased towards the med tech side. So I, I can't speak about um, many other sectors in the financing climates in, in those regions from a venture capital perspective, but certainly um, from the med tech side, I, I, I have a lot of experience now. and. Um, I think maybe I'll just back up for a second because I think that just to, to look at like Canada and the, the idea of like what can you learn from another country and or other countries and how can we take that back to Canada to, to be more innovative. If we look at the med tech space, the largest medical device market in the world is by far the United States. And the the like be all end all for getting medical devices out is getting coding through CMS. And oftentimes, whatever CMS, Centers for Medicare, Medicaid, determines there to be coding and coverage for, there's sort of this trickle down effect on other smaller private payers. So how do people get coding through CMS? Well, oftentimes CMS wants to see that you've proven out your technology in a specific marketplace. It's very hard to do in the United States because there are a thousand payers. And so trying to find an ecosystem in which you can actually demonstrate a technology is different or difficult. So many, many people go to the VA hospital network because it's a single payer system. 
And this is a real opportunity in the States that a lot of entrepreneurs look to to try to deploy their technology to show that it works and to show that it, there's a health economics case to be made for it. We should learn from that because we have this tremendous opportunity where we have 13 scenarios just like that where we have the ability to engage with a payer that is a provider and get a technology out, get it out early if it works well and it saves money on Canadians, but then also enable Canadian companies to accelerate their growth in, in, into some of these larger markets like the United States. So we have a tremendous opportunity there, totally underutilized. So this, the idea of not having the right receptors to test technology, absolutely right. Um, we need to have processes in place to be able to do health technology assessment and then have that lead to procurement if a certain number of success metrics are met. So, so there's an opportunity there that's underutilized. Now go back to where does the venture capital, uh, wh where does the venture capital space stand with respect to medtech in Canada? And as a company, we've been very successful in getting uh, angel and high net worth individual investment. So um, we've. Uh, in, in terms of dollar values, we've brought in about three and a half million of that type of investment. We've brought in another million to a million and a half in grants and awards, and then we brought in more in, in, in the form of debt. Um, we've never brought any institutional money into the company, and that's not without trying. So we, uh, just to be like fully blunt about the situation that we're in, we uh, embarked on raising a Series A financing round over two years ago. And when we, when we uh, decided to do that, we decided we were going to raise three to five million, which seemed like a, a reasonable amount of money to raise based on the stage of the company. Um, we've persistently had, uh, particularly Canadian VC, VCs take sort of a wait and see approach. You're too early, you're too early. So there's, and, and now that we're raising that volume of money, we're, no angel wants to invest because they're, $10,000, $25,000 check doesn't mean a lot in the context of a larger raise like that. So we're in this very difficult funding gap that's hard to fill. So we started to go the route of looking at strategic investment in the company. So looking at the big players in the advanced wound care space that might have an interest in this technology over the long term and getting their interest. We were able to get the commitment from one of the largest players in the advanced wound care space to participate in this financing round. And then we were able to get about five different VCs who wanted to participate in a syndicate glom onto that, but nobody would do the deal without a lead financial investor. That was the cement that would bring everything together, and the strategic investment was contingent upon that lead investor setting the terms for the round. We're still in that same spot. So uh, we've certainly got the commitment, the sideline commitments from, from Canadian investors, but nobody's willing to stick, out, sort of stick their neck out to put the terms on the round. And so now we're getting, over the last two months, we've had all of this incoming interest in acquisition. And so the idea about this, how do we prevent early exits, it's, it's like very front and center for us right now because we're, we're speaking of banging your head against a wall, this financing round is taking forever. And then we're, it, we're at the same time, we have probably 10 advanced wound care companies that want to buy the company out at this stage. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it, it ends up being not that difficult of a decision to make if, if you're forced to make that decision. So what we need to do uh, in the med tech space is really create funding across the continuum. So angels fund early stage investments. We need, we need seed investments. We need early early stage investments and we need growth stage investments and we do not cover that spectrum right now. Um, and as a result, we're, we're going to continue to see these early exits because that's where the opportunity is and it's about you know, trying to create the, opportun the, the most opportune path, but if you can't, you gotta, you gotta work with what you've got. And so um, filling that financing gap is key, taking more shots on net, so having this tolerance for uh, failure essentially. So you need to invest in more companies to find the unicorns. And um, I think that that, that entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit at the venture investment level doesn't exist. So we need to make sure that that, that gets in there as well. That's great. Okay, thanks very much. I'm going to come back a little bit later and talk a little bit more about sort of the early exits by Canadian startups. Um, but also, I am curious uh, from your standpoint, Morris has done so many things for the ecosystem. What um, 
initiatives have you found that are most effective in helping to grow startup or scale startup companies in Canada? Um, well, as I, I think as I mentioned, the, um, as the ecosystem has matured, not just um, you know, in the Toronto region, but across the country, um, I think as a, as a support institution, we can shift more of our energy now to the accelerating and scaling companies. So um, I think the, the, the uh, energies are aligned in terms of where, uh, uh, where the opportunity is for us to make a bigger, a bigger contribution. And that leads to you know, helping with talent recruitment. It's, it's filling capital gaps, building bridges to not just national but international uh, investment sources, talent sources, and so on. Um, we have also, I would say, over the last uh, um, three, four years, really started to double down on this sort of demand side of the innovation equation. Um, and one of the things I'm really optimistic about, which is, which is relatively new, is the high level of engagement of Canadian corporations in, in engaging more with the startup ecosystems. And so, um, it's, it's very encouraging because we know there is a, a R&D spending deficit there and um, adding to the potential for collaboration between established firms and academic centers by having established firms also um, engage with young companies and, and um, provide a, a more uh, connected um, um, conveyor belt, if you want, is, is I think a really interesting opportunity and I hope we can um, we can think about how to incent that behavior even more. Um, on this sort of um, procurement um, test bed side, um, we've gone on very, uh, partnered uh, very specifically with some of the, the systems as well as corporate partners. So we have a, a program, for example, um, just to, Brienne has, has sparked my, uh, my, my focus on med tech here, but we have a program that we, we uh, have worked on for the last four or five years with the province of Ontario. If you think about the provincial healthcare system in Ontario, um, single payer, 14 million people, um, extraordinary um, potential economic engine. But when we look at the history of that system buying made in Ontario medtech um, devices and diagnostics, uh, almost non-existent. And so we started to work with the, the uh, Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Economic Development, the regulator, small businesses, large businesses, to create a new kind of table to say, how would we redesign the health technology assessment process to better procure for innovation? So you get away from the low cost acquisition, you procure for value, and you can work with these young firms to actually design, leverage the key opinion leaders in the system to design the study that actually will generate the data that the system needs to buy. Because we also don't want our system to buy stuff just because it's local. We believe our innovations will stack up, but if the data doesn't exist, how do we create the data so the system can, can make the buying decision at the other end? What's been fascinating about this is, first of all, when we surfaced um, opportunities, fantastic innovations came forward that were absolutely transformational, so this is not about incremental innovation. Um, and then the studies that we have been designing have been highly relevant to other markets. So this project that started as a very local provincial initiative, uh, the most interesting thing is it's been really easy to create Excite International, with participation from the US, the FDA, Kaiser Permanente, all the key players, the NHS, the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand. And that is now up and running, but it's really hard to get the other provincial health systems to partner. So that it goes to one of our fundamental challenges is, we, our market is already so small, we need better leverage um, and create a more coherent buying system even when these jurisdictional issues may be, may be in the way. Because the opportunity is, if you can create that receptor in partnership with your international partners, who by the way all have the same problem, it's not a unique Canadian problem, then a Canadian company like Brienne's can test their technology in a market in Canada and immediately the data from that test or that study will be accepted in other markets and create the, the pull from those other regulated systems so the studies don't have to be repeated. Yeah. Um, so I think there are business process 
um, changes almost that we can think through in partnership with uh, the public uh, procure buyers of technology as well as the private sector and create a new conversation about what innovations do we need, how do we get the data to test and validate, and then more importantly, how do we think about um, data and evidence and the regulator, not as a policeman that, that regulates for performance and cost, uh, but what if we flip that paradigm around and say we now need to think about evidence and data as a way to accelerate the adoption of the best innovations. And once we do that, I think we can, we can begin to um, create systems that are much more aligned uh, with the kind of innovations we are going to have to diffuse into our systems to get um, the growth rates we want and, and the lift we want. Okay, great. That, that's super helpful. Um, just to sort of continue uh, our discussion, I'd love to talk a little bit about how can, how can Canada attract and retain the best people and the best companies. And just to sort of kick off the, this discussion, to talk, I'd love to talk a little bit about immigration. And we know that all strong ecosystems succeed by attracting top-tier talent. In Silicon Valley, attracts many of the most, uh, many of the smartest and most motivated people from across the country. Having spent four years in Silicon Valley, I can say it was very, very rare to actually meet somebody who had grown up there. They they moved to Silicon Valley to be a part of that ecosystem. Uh, similarly, uh, in Israel, which uh, has been talked a lot about in terms of their tremendous growth driven by tech entrepreneurs, Israel has a population of 8 million people. They have 6,000 startups and more VC capital, per, more VC per capita than any other country in the world. Uh, there's a, been a lot written about why has Israel been so successful, but one of the key factors continually mentioned is the role of immigration and how is, Israel was very open to the immigration of smart, talented, hungry people who came and built Israel as a great tech uh, ecosystem. Um, and so, you know, consistent with this theme, I mentioned the CVA, CVCA earlier, their second major recommendation to the federal government was to address the talent shortage in Canada, particularly in engineering and sales, by encouraging and facilitating the immigration of talented, motivated people into Canada. And so with that, we'd love to turn it over to Marty, who is a recent immigrant to Canada, talented, moved to Canada, and have him tell us a little bit about his experiences as an immigrant and how that whole process went. Yeah, and I certainly have thoughts on this topic um, <laughs> as I'm personally living it. Um, and I'll start with my favorite metric, which is 52% uh, of IPOs in uh, California, uh, those companies were founded by immigrants. Uh, and and it's, it, it's astounding to think about the impact that that's had. So. Um, it, I, th I think we need to also divide this challenge into two components. And, and the easy part to fix is the work permit issue. And I think a lot of the discussion around uh, immigration is, is really centered on that, and a point system versus a startup you know, system. And, and, and that's one component. And yes, we need to fix that. And yes, we need to make it easier for uh, executives, uh, non-engineering executives, to come into Canada. I, I think the more important component to fix is how do we keep folks here? And how do we allow them to then attract more folks to come into this ecosystem? And if you think about it, if you're a company, you wanna get your first customer, but then you wanna keep that customer. And you want that customer to then serve uh, as a great reference point so you can attract more customers. So I'm gonna get really personal. So the only reason I got a work permit is because I have uh, incredible support with my partners, which includes Sonovus and Suncor, that were able to basically put some leverage to, to allow me to come into the country. Now I'm in the country, I have a family. Uh, so let me just start with, I, uh, I need to buy a house, because if I don't buy a house, I can't get my kids into a school district in Canada. But then I find out even if I buy a house, my kids aren't guaranteed to stay in the school district because I'm not Canadian. At any moment's notice, my kids can be kicked out of my school because I'm a landed immigrant. Think about that. I've got three kids. I call up my wife and I'm saying, hey, by the way, 
uh, it, it, you know, this is just, this is a really, really difficult situation to put someone in. Second, like most people, I would say, particularly in markets like Vancouver or Toronto where the housing market is a bit inflated, I have a mortgage, but as a landed immigrant, I have to pay a premium to get that mortgage. So every month I pay what is basically a flight risk tax, which is outrageous, just outrageous when I look at what I'm paying to live in Vancouver, uh, specific to this. That doesn't even include, I might add, BC's most recent effort to basically put a stop on all immigration coming in, which was they put a tax on houses or housing for, for immigrants. Uh, I'll mention one other one, which is things like dependents. I have a mother-in-law who's lived with us for 10 years. Uh, she's not allowed in the country because Canada won't allow or won't recognize dependents of immigrants. How do I deal with this? My, I have three kids. They've lived with their grandmother entire lives. Sorry, can't do it. So I've been asked on several occasions to call my colleagues in Silicon Valley and encourage them to come up here and join companies where I think they could have an enormous impact. And right now my answer is no, I won't. That's a real problem. And then they asked me, well, what's the process? Well, so like I said, I got my work permit because I have strong partners. Now I'm going through this process of permanent residence to try to allow myself to stay in this country. If anyone has been through that process here, I'd be interested to hear how your experience went. My experience is it's a complete black hole where you basically just throw in a whole bunch of information, keep throwing it in, and then get no input, no feedback, nothing. So what does that mean? Again, go back to school. Each September 1st, I cross my fingers and hope that my kids can get into our school, which is right down the street from our house. And I hope that my permanent residence will come in before that happens because then, then and only then I can actually guarantee that my kids get in here. So, and where am I in the process? I have no idea. But if you can't keep a guy like me, or you got me into the country. Right now, if you were to ask me would I do it again, I'd say, mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got to get to the point where I'm willing to call my friends and say, you've got to come up here. And it starts with just some of these simple little things and it's about, 20 little things that all could be tweaked, none of which I think would cost this company or country uh, taxpayer dollars. And on the contrary, by again, inviting more folks like me, I think you'd have this very significant uh, feedback loop where it would create jobs, create uh, innovation, et cetera. So don't just think about work permits, think about the whole process of getting and retaining folks into this country. Okay. I'm heated, I'm heated on this subject, so. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Marty. That was extremely powerful, so thank you very much. Um, the other side of immigration, of course, is to make sure that we keep the, uh, keep the ta most talented people in Canada and we don't suffer from brain drain. And we would love to understand your perspective on this uh, and what you see. As, as many people in the audience likely know, Jeff Hinton, who was one of the fathers of AI, he was based in, at U of T. He was recently hired by Google and moved to Silicon Valley. And he's just one of several uh, of our most talented, promising Canadians who leave the country. And I'm, in, I'm curious what you see in Waterloo. Global talents are, will go where there are opportunities for where they, what they want to do. So what we need to do is create these opportunity and sustain them. When I think about George Hinton, Jeff Hinton, the first thought that comes to my mind is, how do we bring him back? How do we create something here? Like he was here, he has a network, so how do we create this? But maybe as important to this is, how do we raise the next Jeff Hinton and be sure that he is in Canada and create different things? Marty mentioned the challenges of retaining people is not only about the partner opportunity also, but also the larger network, the family. And I've seen this also at the Institute. Smart people are usually marry smart people. Suddenly you have a target of opportunity somewhere. You try to convince that person to come, but they're partner. You have to find a position, you have to find ways. And that's where ecosystem and networks are critically important. And then you stumble onto rules of 
regulation because the profession of the partner is something which is very different than the academic world and have to go through all of this. And if you really want to be innovative, if you want really be to be kind of competing in the rest of the world, this is not something that can be done only from the small part of entrepreneurial people. As a country and communities, we have to address this. We have to find ways to make this happen. Great. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And then on this whole topic of uh, retaining people and moving to retaining companies, so this is something that was touched on earlier. Um, there's a lot of talk about Canadian companies that are sold to are sold when they're still very young. Um, for instance, Waterloo-based Buffer Box was acquired by Google before it was two years old. Um, Halifax-based Go Instant was acquired by Salesforce when it had 20 employees. And most recently, Toronto-based Chango was acquired by Rubicon. In terms of the stats, I mean, those are some anecdotes, but in terms of the stats, over the past five years, 183 tech companies in Canada were acquired. 70% of those companies were acquired by U.S. corporations. Now, for, some, for perspective, if you look at the U.S. numbers in the U.S. over the past five years, 2,300 tech companies were acquired, which is a, within striking distance of the sort of the 10 to 1 uh, population difference. But what is most interesting is if you look at the price of those U.S. companies that were acquired, they were acquired for three to four times more than, their, than the Canadian tech companies that were acquired, which indicates that Canadian companies are selling out earlier. And so rather than continuing to build these companies in Canada, they are selling out early, and in the majority of the case, selling to U.S. companies. Uh, so, Brianne, I'd love to talk, turn it over to you and picking up on your discussion that you had earlier in terms of you know, the temptation or the opportunity be, to be sold early. Yeah, I, and it's, it's, I wouldn't even call it a temptation. It's, at the end of the day, it often makes the most business sense to do, just because if you don't have a runway for financing, you're either running it into the ground, or you do have an opportunity to get, in this case, a technology that can really change people's lives out to patients in one way or another. Um, in the situation that we're in, my, my real goal was to get the money to take us from where we are today to the point where we would have coverage under the CMS umbrella. That's a three to four year time frame from where, from where we're at. It's gonna cost us probably about $10 million to get to that point. And if we can do that, we can probably command a tenfold increase on our valuation compared to what we could get today. So um, in terms of acquisition, getting companies a little bit further provides a huge opportunity, but also at that point, we're gonna have revenues that now, if we sell the company, are not gonna be Canadian revenues. So um, there's, there's a huge opportunity missed there in terms of growing the company, growing the R&D team. Um, if, if we were to go the route of being acquired, who knows what happens after that stage. Like most of the companies that we're talking to are either Europe or US based. So having a small peripheral company in, in Canada may not be of interest. So um, I, think that, I think that we really need to address that gap. And you know, some of the concerns that, that were addressed about why, uh, why American investors might not invest in Canada. Maybe those Canadian companies, don't, the management teams don't work as hard. Well, that's certainly not the case in all these companies. And even in the ones that have been acquired, I'm sure those management teams were not lazy. I'm sure that this was the environment that they were in and these were the opportunities that they worked very hard to create and that was the best that they could do given, given the environment. So we really need to change that environment. We need to make sure that there's, there's funding that spans the continuum. If a company continues to meet milestones and grow in a positive and effective way, don't, don't have mechanisms that will prevent that company from, from being funded. Um, the pull to the Bay Area is very strong in that respect because there are, it, there is this perception, I would say, there, just ne having never lived there, but just having communicated with a lot of different investors and entrepreneurs in the space, the, when they're being quite frank with you, they say, you know, they really see that as the epicenter of technology, and in many ways it is. 
And so if your company's worth anything and a, a worth any merit at all, why would you not move a two hour flight away to somewhere where you can really accelerate your company? So there's this perception of what's wrong with you to stay where you're staying. Um, and I don't know how much that weighs into the decision-making process. It's very hard when you're dealing with funding agencies to get really clear answers about why they don't invest. Um, so you end up left, you're left sort of guessing in a lot of these situations. But I think we need to make reasons that are really compelling reasons of why a company wants to stay in Canada. There needs to be really strong reasons for that. And I'm very passionate about this in the med tech space because there is such a compelling reason we can create for that. So. Um, you know, part of, I think part of our job as, as startup entrepreneurs is really to sort of foster the ecosystem itself. I've been working very hard at that in, with respect to the whole idea of health technology assessment. I've been working very closely with the Alberta government to put a, a process in place to test locally. But uh, that's, you know, that takes my time away from focusing exclusively on the business to try to create this, this innovation climate. So. It's a challenge, but um, I think we, we do have really smart people and we've got, we've got the resources we need. We just need to put them in the right places. Great. And then we have about uh, two minutes left. Oh, so I'll turn it over to you for final thoughts on this topic. So maybe I'll give a more optimistic perspective. Um. Uh, I mean, my sense is, you know, acquisitions of young technology companies is part of the food chain. Um, and we have to, on some, on some levels, accept that. Often young companies build parts of a solution, not the whole solution. And it's, in fact, better for them to uh, be, uh, become part of a larger delivery machine. Um, so we can't you know, try to ring fence this. I think our job is to create the best possible conditions in a holistic way for companies to grow and scale from Canada into global companies. Uh, the good news is there are a lot of really good reasons to grow a company from Canada today. And one of the things I think that, that you heard about in indirect ways is, is rethinking and retooling our innovation programs to not pick winners but back winners, to, to really um, double down on the, on the companies that are getting market traction and are driving scale, um, to better leverage the extraordinary diaspora nature of our entrepreneurs um, so that you know our acquisition lens is always the US there's a whole other thing happening today with diaspora entrepreneurs in Canada that are over indexing in focusing on emerging markets and guess what those are growing faster so the more we can shift our um, our focus on exports and partners and capital um, beyond just our established uh, traditional markets to tap into um, emerging markets. I think that creates a whole other opportunity. But mostly, I think we need a real plan. This is about an own the podium strategy for our high performing companies. We need to know exactly who they are, what they need, what the needs of their sectors are, and then do everything we can to make sure that they have the best um, possible opportunity to get to scale. And that is a very sort of a nuanced and triage strategy. Um, and then we need to know, you know, what's the layer behind them. It's a, it's a sports team approach um, to, uh, to get those top companies um, into global markets and scaling. And in that way, make it as easy as possible for them getting the talent in, getting capital, um, so that they have reasons to grow from here. Because we have a huge amount to offer. Um, and, um, and there's lots of good reasons why really, really smart people from all over the world um, want to actually come and, and live and work in Canada. And we need to raise that flag as part of our innovation brand globally. Great. Well, listen, thank you very much to everybody on the panel. Great uh, discussion and really appreciated the thoughts not only on the challenges, but more importantly on some of the solutions that we can be thinking about as we try to address the, the challenge of growing the next generation of great technology companies in Canada. So there's going to be a buffet lunch just served out in the hallway. You can bring it back to the table. Um, essentially, you have 30 minutes to grab your lunch, um, to try to find $10 million for Brienne to scale up, and to apologize to Marty on behalf of all Canadians.